Hi, this is Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a whistle stop overview of my software craftsmanship imperative presentation. If you'd like a more relaxed version of this presentation uh, at your offices, for example, then please get in touch. We'll be happy to come in and do a Q&A, run a coding dojo for your developers. So please get in touch. I'll be delighted to hear from you. When I think about software craftsmanship, I tend to think of it in a wider context. In 1943, there was only one programmable electronic computing device in the world. It was called Colossus, and you can see a working rebuild of it at Bletchley Park. Fast forward to today, we estimate there are more than 500 billion computing devices operational in the world. We're not just talking about things with keyboards and screens here, but also the computing devices in your car, in your television, in your toaster. If this trend continues, in 40 to 50 years' time, there could be in excess of 500 quadrillion computing devices in the world. They could outnumber ants. They could even outnumber insects. By the end of this century, it's feasible that computing devices could outnumber all forms of life on Earth, including bacteria. They could be swimming through your bloodstream, deciding which cells to kill. At the same time, the software that these devices is running is becoming exponentially more complex. This is the first imperative for the software craftsman. That as society grows ever more reliant upon software, the software arguably needs to become ever more reliable. The more we depend on code, the more dependable the code needs to be. But there's also another imperative for software craftsmanship. And to illustrate it, let's imagine a game. Two teams, Team Waterfall and Team Agile. And they're competing to guess a four-digit number. Team Waterfall, being a waterfall team, guesses all four digits in one go, and we tell them whether they got it right or wrong. Team Agile, being an Agile team, guesses one digit at a time. How might this play out? What's the worst case scenario for Team Waterfall? What's the maximum number of guesses it might take them to figure out what the four digit number is? It might take them as many as 10,000 guesses. Team Agile, on the other hand, might take a maximum of 40 guesses. So I would bet on Team Agile. What if we gave team, gave team Waterfall a big advantage? For every one guess that we give to Team Agile, we give 10 guesses to Team Waterfall. So in each go, Team Agile gets one guess, and Team Waterfall got, gets 10 guesses. Which team would you bet on now? I would still bet on Team Agile. Their chances of winning the game are at least twice that of Team Waterfall, even though Team Waterfall gets 10 times as many guesses in each go. There's an important lesson here for software development. What defines the winners is not how fast they deliver, how many guesses they get in each go, but how fast they can learn from what they deliver. Team Agile can learn faster than Team Waterfall, so I would bet on Team Agile. So we want as many goes as possible. We want to learn as much as possible with each go. So this is all about not necessarily how fast we do stuff, it's about how quickly we're able to learn from what we do. Now if you were to approach a marathon as if it were a sprint, so say for the first 100 meters of a marathon you approach it as if you were running a 100 meter sprint, by the end of that first 100 meters you would almost certainly be leading the race, you'd be number one. But what after 200 meters, and after 300 meters, and 400 meters, what happens is, when you run at a sprint pace, lactic acid will build up in your muscles faster than your body's ability to dispose of it, and eventually you will start to feel pain and cramps, and end up being carried off on a stretcher. The same is true in software development. Software development, more often than not, in fact 99 times out of 100 cases, is a marathon, not a sprint, but we often approach it as if it was a sprint. We start the first release as if it's the only release, as if the whole goal of the project is to get to the first deadline. 
without realizing that there's going to be another deadline after that, and another deadline after that, and another deadline after that, just like we're running a marathon. A marathon is a series of 100 meter sprints, but you can't run it as if it's a series of 100 meter sprints, because if you do run it at, at an unsustainable pace like that, the crap in your code will build up fast, faster than your ability to deal with it as developers, and progress will get more difficult and more painful. An example of a marathon that's being run right now is the TV and video on demand uh, market where the smart players are beginning to realize that they're running a marathon, they're not running a sprint. And a sustainable pace, you could call it a relentless pace if you like, in the long term is going is to define who will win and lose in this marketplace. Now, we've got to talk a little bit about the cost of change of software. Traditionally, what we found is that as software grows, over time, it just gets harder and harder and harder to change, exponentially so. And eventually, it becomes almost impossible to change the software. One of the key goals of extreme programming, as Kent Beck explained in his excellent book, is to flatten that cost of change curve so that we can sustain the pace of innovation relentlessly ad infinitum for as long as we need to. And we can learn as much as we can with each of those releases. One of the holy grails now of software development for many companies is continuous delivery. Not necessarily delivering lots of features with each release, but the ability to deliver feature after feature after feature after feature relentlessly, learning as much as they can from each delivery. Just like Team Agile, guessing one digit at a time. So this is very important to software intensive businesses. Another thing we need to consider, which will be important when we discuss the cost of change, is the cost of finding and fixing bugs. Um, there's a mountain of evidence. I mean, the jury really is not out on this. Um, it's been proven beyond any reasonable doubt that in actual fact, the more effort we put into catching defects early, the faster we go. It seems counterintuitive because a lot of people talk about higher quality costing more. But what we find is to a point it actually costs less and takes less time to deliver better software. And the cost of finding and fixing defects is a very important component in the cost of changing software. What makes code harder to change? Well, first of all, most importantly, is whether or not people can read it and understand it. There's a statistic that tells us that developers spend some 90% of their time reading and trying to understand code not just other people's code but sometimes their own code that they wrote some time ago a few weeks ago or even a few days ago and they've forgotten how it works um, so making code easy to understand is a prime directive for software craftsmen complexity the more complicated code is the easier it is to get it wrong the harder it is to test the harder it is to understand so more complicated code is much, much harder to change. So we, we should strive as craftsmen to make our code as simple as we possibly can. Less is more, definitely. Duplicate code. When we start copying and pasting logic, and then we need to make a change to the common logic in that copied and pasted code, we have to change it in multiple places, which, multiple, which multiplies the cost of change. Similarly, when we uh, make a change, and we probably all had ex this experience as programmers, we make what we think is a very small change to one part of the system, and that breaks two other parts of the system. So we fix those, and by fixing those, we realize we've broken some more parts of the system. Before we know it, we're ripping up half the code just to get the thing working again. Uh, a lot of people experience this. It's called the ripple effect, when you're you know, like throwing a, a pebble into the middle of a pond and the changes ripple out through the dependencies in the code. So it's imperative for a craftsman to manage carefully the dependencies in their code, to limit the extent of those ripples. And finally, regression test assurance. As we saw, the longer it is between introducing a bug and discovering a bug, the more it costs to fix that bug, exponentially so. So a bug that's discovered in production in a release, for example, could be as much as a thousand times more to fix. So we want to catch the bugs almost as soon as they appear in the code. And for this, the best way we found to do that is to have automated regression tests. And how good those tests are at catching bugs and catching them quickly and cheaply 
is a major factor in how easy it will be to make changes to your code because it's very hard to change code without accidentally introducing bugs in dependent code. So these are all very, very key factors. So that's the craftsmanship imperative. Code has got to become a lot more reliable and it's become, got to become a lot easier to change. And as craftsmen, there are things that we can do, steps we can take, skills we can apply, disciplines we can use that will lead to code that's not just more reliable, not just easier to change, but will actually be cheaper to produce in the first place. To find out more, please visit codemanship.com or email me at jason.gorman at codemanship.com.